The key is providing other people more value. I just don't see people doing it. It blows me away and it is absolutely, I want the full, and it is absolutely going down on Instagram DM. Influencers or you pay for it. Either you pay in Facebook ads, Instagram ads, sponsorship deals, YouTube pre-rolls against people of those interests, fashion, you know, food, wine, sneakers, technology, or, or you reach out to people that have audiences. Search hashtags, click them, look at the account, then see how you can bring them value, DM them, go in soft, bring value, rinse and repeat two, three, four, five thousand times. So the thing Manny should do is go Upper East Side. Looking good, this guy looks like he took a picture. Hey G. Instagram influencers right now, today, for doers, is the probably be- only behind Facebook ads, the single best arbitrage in marketing. And then you try and then you learn. When you're a pioneer, you have to taste it. There's no report, there's no white paper, there's no modeling mixed metrics that are gonna teach you how that's gonna work. When you're the first explorer, you have to taste the berries and hopefully they're not poisonous. We're living through this incredible era of massive opportunity, yet everybody's talking and reading and nobody's fucking doing. Start fucking executing. So what does that mean? That means you should write a medium blog post every week. Content, podcast, video, written, quotes, pictures, and then tactics. What scares me quite a bit is that most of you, when you see these logos, you think of a piece of content that you make and you think of those five channels and more as places where you distribute it. Twitter and Facebook are tools. Twitter and Facebook are markers and crayons. They're a fax machine. These are not just distribution channels. These are channels where you have to natively story tell. Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Instagram are ABC, NBC, and CBS. And what I've figured out for the last decade is how to make MASH and The Andy Griffin Show and ER and Seinfeld. That's our word, brought to you by Room for Freedom, the app that allows you to find places to stay while you travel and choose your own currency, and there's no records kept on site, so they won't be subpoenaed. And I'm Jim Jesus, and I'm here with Nick Hazelton, the former anarcho yakalist the current yakker. Is that right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess I guess it's, uh, I, don't, I don't know what I'm calling myself now anymore. Um, yeah, I guess the yakker, yeah. the yak kid, <clears throat> whatever you want to do. When, if it involves yaks, I think I've... I've pretty much got that. Yeah, well, you should probably keep the anarcho list, but just, just, just you know, even though you pod faded on that one, just keep the you keep your yakking with thing, yakking with Nick thing, but just be called an anarcho list. You know, and then they can all go yeah. back and find your episodes and know your, know your kind of progression, right? Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. I still, you know, in the anarchist and narco capitalist circles, I'll I'll still call myself the narco list to those who who understand what it means i guess i'll use it but i think that and the reason why i dropped it is um is that nobody really knows what it is and it's taken like two years for people to be able to pronounce it the right way even the narco capitalists can't say a narco yakitalism uh, it's just three so letters it, it's just the first three letters. I, it's the same word <laughs> you know but yeah yak and cap it's pretty much the same Thing yeah. too but i swear people can't say it and i don't i don't know what it is but i uh, i decided that's that's part of the reason why it was i wasn't using it so i like to say anyak now but a narco list is still fun to say yeah, anyak is fun so yeah um we got a lot to talk about like last time you were on the show we were talking about uh digital marketing and your business and your farm because you're a yak farmer for those of you who are just tuning in for the first time uh an actual yak farmer in oregon wow uh, and you've been a yak farmer since you were what, 15, 16, somewhere in there? Yeah, 15, yeah. yeah. Uh, so we got to talk about that. And you're a sto Are you still a stoic? Is that, is, I don't think that's the right word for it. <laughs> is that the right word for it? <laughs> yeah, stoic, yes. Oh, okay. Yes, I, I call myself an aspiring stoic. Okay. So we should probably get right into that. Uh, so yeah, let's talk about marketing because last time we talked, we were talking about 
how to do digital marketing, and I kind of gave you a couple ideas that I heard from uh, Gary Vay Nurchuk, and you <laughs> thought that was all pretty interesting. And uh, have you tried employing any of those things at all yet? I have. Um, I don't think I have actually. I have it written down, and in fact, it's it's still right here in front of me. I think. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, no, it's, I don't know where this was, but I have it. Um, <laughs> I haven't been working on marketing a whole bunch recently. I've been trying to. Um, I had some issues with the yaks, and I've been tr and the pigs. I've been managing pastures right now, so I've kind of not been focused on marketing, which is a which is a problem. Honestly, yeah. I, I should be I should be trying to keep that up. But I think that the most thing, the things I was most interested in were that Instagram, um, and, and I think on Facebook too. But targeting in a local area that was what most interested me, and and I haven't looked into that. Um, I know that uh, that's that's the plan though. So I yeah I still I still remember what you told me, but no I haven't. Yeah, and what I told I you was kind of like go uh, not on Facebook because on Facebook it's a little creepy, uh, but on on Instagram or Twitter you can do area searches in your area and then look for things like that's relevant to your business. So if you're, you know, if you're, um, you know, you're selling yak meat, uh, it'd probably be a good idea to find the foodies and look up you know tags like foodie or because you know on Instagram they're really big on like putting thirty hashtags in every single picture. Yeah. Yeah. So you you look for those like things like oh like bizarre like any kind of bizarre meat like if you know if if they're eating venison or something like that you should probably contact them because they may be interested in yak meat because that's probably not something that they're too familiar with. And you go on there and you just talk talk to them and say hey like I you know I have some uh, some some yak meat and I'd be really interested for you to try it and uh, give give your thoughts on it. And and you know you basically you're giving them value. And it kind of puts the sometimes it puts people in that mind of debt. Not always, but you know, like oh, I feel like I have to say something about like the steak someone you know gave to me for free on Instagram. And uh, and sometimes they'll be like, wow, like you know, this person at you know Nick's Farms like has the greatest yak meat ever. Like I highly recommend you guys pick up a, a, a shank or something. And, and you know that brings a lot of attention to you. And that that attention is pretty much pretty cheap if you consider if you're just sending them a piece of meat, right? Right. Uh, I don't think it'll work on Facebook because when other people comment on my Facebook posts about things and it like it seems like there's they're coming from some sort of business or something like, oh, yeah, like, you know, I, I deal in gold or whatever. And I think it's it, that those pieces of silver are pretty nice. I'm, I'm going to be like, that's kind of creepy. <laughs> but if it happens on Twitter, I expect it like that's kind of the platform. Same with sure. Instagram, but I'm not too familiar with Instagram. I'm really bad with Instagram. I should be better with it. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so that's interesting. I've done a little bit of that with making sure that I'm following and um and and get, well, I guess I can't really make sure I get followed, but I I try to um get into the awareness of other people who are who are doing similar things. So I think that expanding, I didn't think about people who are um going for the exotic meat because there's a lot of people out there, you know, mm -hmm. people who are uh, looking for venison. And and those dark red meats that are very similar to yak. That now that's a really good idea. But I've done stuff like that with chefs. I'm trying to follow a bunch of chefs um, that are local, and making sure I'm following other farms, which doesn't necessarily help. But usually most farms aren't um, aren't competing with me because most people aren't doing meat. And if they are, it's you know it's different. So the yak category is a little bit different. But so I've done a little bit of that. But I think that I could be doing. Um, a, a definitely a better job. Yeah. So I started kind of doing that a little bit. I just didn't have, I just, just recently found some time to kind of get out there and do that. Not much. So, um, for, so for that, for that thing we do, we do the Liberty in the pub every month and it's always been kind of s slow. Like there's been a couple people who've dropped by a lot of the times it's usually just, you know, the three regulars, but sometimes we'll get like a fourth person that comes in. Um, but I just decided like, Hey, let's, let's actually try to reach out a little bit. And I just looked for a libertarian in my, you know, in my area. And, you know, mm -hmm. I wasn't going in there saying, Hey, we have a hangout, come hang out. Cause that's, that's not how you do it. But, you know, just like getting involved in a conversation. So if people are talking about libertarianism and, you know, they say something, I can be like, Oh yeah, I totally agree that, you know, the federal reserve is horrible or yeah, I totally agree. Taxation is theft or whatever. And people like, well, think that you're providing you're providing them value and they like that but because you're wearing that employee t-shirt the liberty on the rocks account they're going to be like okay this guy's pretty interesting oh he oh he has a hangout oh that's you know down the street from me i should go check that out sometime 
And um, last night, out of, just out of nowhere, we had no we had no idea that this would happen. We also bought a little bit of Facebook ad time. <clears throat> but yeah, a couple of people we've never met before. They're like, yeah, we just moved in, uh, or he just moved in, you know, a couple uh, a couple of months ago, or whatever. And we we're just looking for libertarians to hang out, and we we're about to hang out with the libertarian party, but we figured this would be a lot cooler. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. yeah. And so it was like, oh, that's I didn't really know like how powerful that kind of stuff was and it was almost kind of scary like how how powerful that stuff is you know reach just reaching out to people and talking to them and and you know we spent 10 bucks on a facebook ad you know that's that's nothing and it really got a lot of attention yeah, yeah. which is really cool i i think that um most people I, like it's and i say this because this happens for me um get scared and think, well, no, that's not going to work. You know, we're going to spend money on marketing. I think marketing and sales, especially is a, it's a hard thing to get comfortable with. At yeah. least it has been for me and I'm still not entirely comfortable with it. And it's partly cause I'm shy. Uh, but it's, I think it's, it's quite surprising what you can do. Like I, I haven't talked about this on the show cause I'm, I'm going to make a presentation. I haven't talked about it at all, I guess, but I sat on this on the highway with a sign that said yak meat for sale um, on the way to uh, the coast here. And dude, I, I got, uh, I didn't get too many people to stop by cause it's kind of a, it's a, it's selling on the highway is not that great of an idea. Um, but I wanted to try it out see what happened. Mm -hmm. And I was surprised, you know, I got, I made three sales in the last two weekends and probably spent a total of four hours just smiling and waving at people as they pass by. And I made, I don't know, 38 bucks. Which isn't yeah. a lot, but it's it surprises you how what these things can do, and and just getting out there, all you have to do is get out there and be in front of people. And if you're interesting, if you're targeting the right people, or you have the right, you know, if you're saying it the right way that makes it look pretty, um, or whatever, it's it's not that hard to do, and and you'll definitely get responses. But it you know sometimes it just doesn't happen, and I don't know, it's a it's a hard game to play, I think, and that's kind of what I try to think of it as is. You know, maybe it'll work out this time. Maybe it won't. But, you know, it, it doesn't hurt as the thing is to get out there um, and put out an ad or um, talk to somebody about it. It just won't hurt you. That's the thing. I think it, you might be looking at it a little bit differently than than I would look at it. Like if I was to go out there and set up a stand and have like yak meat and whatever, uh, I, I'd be much more not con so much concerned about the people that are come like the two or three people that are coming up to me and oh tomorrow we had three three people and you know like a week later we had you know four people or yeah we, you know we had three people like forget all that just the fact that there was you know eight hundred cars every hour that passed by me who saw me and you know and may have seen someone stopped at the stand and was like oh that should be something we should check out one of these days and just keep doing that and then let that attention build and then people will just automatically well not automatically but people will start re realizing like hey that does that yak thing we should go we should go get some meat one of these days and they might like it and you know that people love you know people like what works like they know what they like and if they like something, they're going to come back to it. You know, like mm -hmm. Jeffrey Tucker is never going to give up McDonald's because he's been there too many times and like too many <laughs> times. Like Burger King can come out with the best burger tomorrow. And he's like, I'm still going to go get a Big Mac. <laughs> just the way it is because he's just so comfortable with them. And that's what you need to do. I think just getting that attention and getting people like used to you and <clears throat> interacting with you and liking what you sell. They'll, they'll, be, uh, they'll be coming back. But yeah. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense yeah. to me. Yeah, I think that that plays a big thing. And I've been talking to uh, to some other entrepreneurs about building a a larger audience and and more of a network. And and that's exactly what they said. Yeah, I didn't think about that very much when I was out there on the on the highway, and because I had Hazelton Farms right there. Yeah, that's that's interesting. Now you know maybe I get a couple people Google it, but yeah, the more times they see me, if I keep doing it, I, I won't because I'm gonna be at the market on weekends now. But mm -hmm. still, the idea is if you're there, um, slowly people will will notice you, and yeah, you'll you'll build that reputation, right? Just just the fact that you're going out there and doing something different stands out in people's minds. So you know when they see you again, they're gonna be like, ah, wasn't that that kid on the side of the road? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense to me. And people like. People like like hustle. If they see someone really hustling, they'll like it. <laughs> I don't know what it is, but yeah, people are kind of intuitively like that guy really know. Like there was there's a guy who follows me, uh, who I followed on Twitter, and it was for nothing else, just how he hustled. 
Like he was just, he just at me and said, Hey, how you doing? And I was like, Oh, he sells Kratom. That's really interesting. And then I realized like, Oh, I see what he's doing. Like this guy's a hustler. And I go and check out his page and all his at replies. And I'm like, this guy is fucking working. <laughs> it's uh-huh. Just some guy in Indonesia selling like bulk Kratom, like huge giant bags, 10 pound bags of Kratom. And I'm like, Holy shit. Like this guy is moving. <laughs> but yeah, wow. and I, w- I just followed him and talked to him just, just because I was like, I was just so like, Wow, like this guy, you know this this guy is going to be building an empire. Just maybe if it does, maybe if it doesn't keep, uh, maybe if they don't try to make it illegal again, he will be. But we'll see. <laughs> mm. Yeah. Did you buy kratom from him? Uh, no. Ah, not yet. No. Well, I, I have my own kratom uh, affiliate thing, so I've been using that. That's like, right. Yeah. So I've got a couple of sales from that, and then I just kind of use that money to kind of. <laughs> <clears throat> to get some more if I needed, but I'm just wrapping up this last little, what is it? How many grams is this? Uh, 112 grams. And then I'm going to done with that. I'm going to be off of it for a couple months. So yeah. yeah, I don't, I don't, I'm not one of those people that take it every single day, but I'll just get it and I'll abuse it. And then once it's out, I'll be like, okay, <laughs> see you in three months. <laughs> so sure. That's, that's the way I keep your it. tolerance low, right? It keeps your tolerance low. keeps me from like having an actual addiction, you know? I'll have yeah. like a temporary addiction. I'll get that little caffeine headache and I'll be done. No problem. Moving right along. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> That's interesting. I, I've used Kratom a couple times and I thought it was I think it was great. Um I guess it yeah, it just made me feel active, but I don't I can't afford yeah. Stuff like that. Um mm-hmm. you know, only I yeah. And it's not it's it's harder to get than than other substances, I guess. But it's interesting. I thought it was um I I I w- everybody was talking about it in the anarchist circles. And mm-hmm. I was like, what's going on with this stuff? And then it, it made sense to me, but that's interesting. Yeah. But yeah, I think that the hustle thing uh, is definitely true. People are really impressed by people who are, who are putting out work. Um, yeah, I don't know exactly. Everybody what it loves is. Oprah. It's just respectful, right? Yeah, look, <laughs> yeah. Look, everybody loves Oprah. She's like the queen of hustle. <laughs> like she's got like TV shows, magazines. No, not TV shows. She has like her own like network, her own television network, and all kinds of other stuff. It's crazy what that lady's doing. You know, she's got so much cake now. It's ridiculous. Tons and tons yeah. of cake. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah. Try that a little bit more, and we'll see. How, we'll we'll do a follow up next time you come on, because that's what I was hoping that you would be doing it this whole time and be like, "Oh, you made a million dollars. You made your bank. first million. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think that I I I need to improve with doing things. I got to figure out how exactly I have to run this business, you know, because it's it's balancing. Because this is what this is the old farmer thing is is that people will will try so hard to be good at farming, and uh, and then they won't market. So they're excellent. They can grow you a beautiful tomato. They can show you the best steak from a yak, you know, but they don't know how to sell it. And yeah. that's the main thing. So I'm like trying to do both, trying to get you the best yak steak and be able to market it and do other things at the same time. And I'm kind of like I'm living the the poor bachelor life right now because I'm not selling. Um, but I'm hoping that this summer I can I can turn that around and. I'm hoping that this month that I'll uh, I'll turn my focus back into marketing again because that needs to happen. Yep. But but you are turning a profit now or no? Um no, I haven't well, I don't think I'm in the black. Um, okay. I I don't haven't done the accounting in a while. My dad does most of that cuz he know, knows numbers better than me. Um but no, I'm not in the black, but I'm hoping that at the end of this year we'll actually start yeah. um Make it probably just depends on how much we spend on fencing, you know. Yeah, um, I've been kind of really interested in marketing. Like one of the things I, I know, I know Brian Sovereign told me not to buy one of these things, but I did, and I bought uh, an Alexa device. What is this? This is the Tap, and that's the one that you can bring with you. And the reason why I wanted the one you can bring with you is because I wanted a, a Bluetooth speaker anyway, like a battery operated one. Um, but I really would just wanted the Alexa thing. Um, and what you can do is you can develop Alexa skills. And when you develop Alexa skills, you can have it like, so like if you have like your day, like every day I can say, you know, what's giving my news flash or whatever, news briefing or whatever. And you can set like what kind of news briefings you want. So my goal is to try to figure out how to get on that with the Lulberts. Cause I, I was doing that with that daily satirical news thing for a while. 
and it was really popular, but not on the medium that it was. I was using it on Anchor, and Anchor kind of just, you know, it was anchored in, <laughs> in terms of popularity. <laughs> like, no one was – people were kind of jumping off of it. And I was like, well, this sucks. I mean, because it's, it's a good platform, and it's really easy to, to create on there, and I could share it to Twitter and Facebook. And everybody loved it on Twitter and Facebook, but on the app itself, I'd get it started turning from like, oh, you have five listeners and a bunch of people applauding to nothing. <laughs> you know, I had like one person listen to one of your thing and applauded it and they didn't even listen to the next one. And it was like, well, what's the point? Cause no one's listening to these things. So I figured why not just put it on the Alexa? Like how many people have Alexa? Like tons of people. Right. Mm -hmm. So my goal is to try to figure out how to get the Lullbirds to be marketed on this thing, giving them something like satirical news. And then they go, Oh, there's that. And then when I say like, you know, brought to the you know, people are like, Oh, they'll check it out. Oh, that's a podcast. Neat. You know, I can add it to my tune in and listen to it on my thing. So, but I don't like the fact that I have something in my device that could potentially listen to me all the time. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Even though this is the one you actually have to like press the button, you know, Alexa, tell me a joke. Would you soda loving spiders like to eat pop flies? Wow. Oh. <laughs> I was waiting for that. I was like, what? <laughs> womp, womp, womp. Um, but yeah, so, I mean, just having something on there where I can just, where people are going to be like, oh, there's like a libertarian satirical news network. That should be fun. <laughs> you know? Yeah. I think that there's, um, I think it makes pretty sound, makes logic. Um, that if you're going to do something like that, like kind of spread out, like you, you have some podcast uh, audience, right? And you're maintaining that by posting regular shows and you're slowly growing that. I'm, you know, I don't know how fast the Lowbirds downloads are growing, but um, just doing this will get you a certain audience. And then if you branch out, go to another area, diversify, right? Mm -hmm. um, diversify your bounds, nigga. Oh, I don't get paid for that. <laughs> Tank financial, <laughs> <laughs> right? But it makes sense because it's gonna, uh, you're gonna, you're branching out, right? Mm -hmm. And and you're going to get a bigger audience just for doing that. Um, I think that that makes sense to me yeah. as a as a way to grow, is to tap into those other um, those other markets, I guess. Yep. So that that's my plan. <laughs> this is just kind of grow there, and it's not because I want to be a professional libertarian, like. If I if I'm going to be anything <laughs> professional when it comes to audio cre or content creation, it's going to be uh, satire. I like I really want to start doing like actual satire work, writing articles and stuff, which I have been doing, but I just need to do more of it and actually put it on sure. the platform and either sell it to somebody for them to you know a ghost let let someone be uh, be someone's ghostwriter or. Uh, write a book or do something like I was talking about using that to kind of direct traffic to my podcast or whatever, you know, it's attention that I'm looking for. And so that later I can try to fi find out a marketable skill for it. I don't want to be a professional libertarian though. That's no. Mm -mm. Yeah. Uh, especially with the economic, I think, I think we're going to be facing another uh, bust here soon and I don't want to be dependent on donations and then everybody lose their job. You know, uh, that's right. <laughs> that doesn't sound fun to me. Yeah. No. Yeah, that'll be hard to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that you you want to be resilient, and I think yeah, media is not the best place. And I would say that even what I'm doing isn't that great. Um, I'm I what I'm trying to do is try to make sure that I can live on very little. Um, so if I really have to cut costs and I'm only selling a yak a year, I'm I can pretty much do that. I I pretty much budgeted that I can live on. Forty-eight thousand uh, a year, not forty-eight thousand, forty-eight hundred a year. Oh wow! Um, just doing farming stuff. If I'm able to uh, supply most of my food, that okay. is right. Um, but I think I can do that. You're also doing like pigs and was was that all you right? Okay. Um, I'm only doing the pigs and the yaks, but my dad and my sister are doing dairy goats, and that's also part of the Hazelton Farms business. Okay. Um, and it would be, you know, my sister's going to be gone and going to college here soon, um, in the next couple of years or so. So I would probably take over that too. So there, there's some, um, I, th I think that I can make a little bit of money doing that at least if, if there goes a, a big, you know, if we actually crash, otherwise I think, um, I can make money, but it's the same thing with, with 
making shows, doing things that are more luxury items, you know, like grass fed meat is not something that you need to live on. Like, yeah. you know, actual <laughs> meat, you could get cheaper other places and entertainment, the same thing when you're really poor, that's uh, the entertainment thing kind of gets thrown out the window. And you're I not going to be paying true, people to. Think... Yeah, I think I, now, that I, now that I've said that, I think that that's actually false. And yeah. that's been shown <laughs> in studies. Yeah, I, I remember doing um, hearing about like during the Great Depression, the big thing that everybody was doing, even though they couldn't get food, they would go to the movie theater. <laughs> that was a big thing back then. Like they would spend their money on movie theater to kind of distract because they didn't want escapism, right? Right. Even right. though I don't provide escapism, <laughs> you know, I don't know. I guess I do because we don't really talk about like, oh, here's the news of event. Like we'll talk about it here and there, but we're not one of those things like, you know reading the newspaper on air than screeching about it. Like, that's not what we do here, which is a lot of what other libertarian media can be. We're having fun and making fun of people. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. It'll be interesting to see. I'm, I'm really too young to know what markets look like and mm -hmm. I haven't done much studying. So yeah, uh, I don't know. I think that, I think that what you're doing, um, diversifying and I think of doing satire would be really fun. Um, that'd be really cool to see you do. It'll be a whole lot better than this. Tell me a <laughs> joke. What do you get when you combine Star Wars and baseball? The umpire strikes out. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> womp, womp. I can definitely do better than that. <laughs> That's really bad. It's, these are like it's the, so terrible. These are like, they're not even dad jokes. They're straight up mom jokes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, mom. It's pretty funny. Thanks. Uh, Jeez. <laughs> yeah i hope you can do better than that yeah <laughs> i think i can well i'm not gonna be telling jokes maybe maybe i should save that for the joke man but yeah that's not my style um so yeah how is your farm doing besides the the marketing we talked a little bit about your financials we should go over your books <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. <now. laughs> but you said it's, you had some it's... some issues though didn't you yeah, recently um, I had a couple yaks die mm. um, because of a parasites, you know, worms, int intestinal parasites, um, which is you know a common issue for grazing animals because of um, I don't know I guess the, I don't I don't actually understand why it is, but um, if you don't manage your pastures the right way, these worms will they're living inside the gut right and they're getting pooped out. They lay eggs. And they get pooped out and then they're they hatch and they move on to the grass blades and then the grazing animals eat them and so mm -hmm. they're back into the system and then eating you know they, they feeding off of what the animal's eating so it really if it gets too bad which it did for a couple of these animals uh, a couple of the yaks um it'll just deteriorate them and they can't absorb the nutrients that they need and they get so tired that they eventually can't eat and i didn't know what was going on because i don't i didn't know much about that um, so I had a couple yaks die, and that was a that was a big deal, and I'm I'm not happy about that. But that's now since the grass is growing again, and uh, um, I'm starting to have more confidence that I can manage pastures. I think that those solutions will be or those problems are fixed now. Um, but we had to deworm everybody, and that was kind of a big thing um, that kind of worried me. I just me. experienced then, that. Yeah. Yeah. The deworming. Yeah. Thing. Yeah. Womp, oh, womp. the ah, ha, ah. I was womp, like, was he talk about his cats? Yeah. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> no, actually, um, I, I, my, uh, my cat. When when I first moved to Vegas, I, I, I didn't have my cat with me. I left her in in Kansas, and she was like really depressed or whatever. We picked her up, but I had another kitten at home, that like was a stray, but she came to my door, and it was it was so adorable. Uh, but she had worms, and um, I dewormed her. But for, I don't know how it happened, but my my cat got worms, which is good because she got really fat when she was depressed about not being with me. So she lost mm -hmm. all of her weight, and then <laughs> was dewormed, and she was good. It was actually like beneficial, I guess. Uh, it's kind of like how people right. get like dietary tapeworms. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> they get tapeworms to lose weight. Um, but what I figured out how to what I did was I started feeding them wet food because I feed them wet dry food. But I started feeding them wet mm -hmm. food, but just putting a little bit of like a canned pumpkin in their th in their food oh. that dewormed them quick, really quick. That was the best way of doing it. I had to do it twice to that one cat kitten, but Kitty Wapolis got it once and she was cured. Yeah, so I was I was wondering huh. like, do you, would would yaks could yaks eat 
uh, pumpkin, pumpkin seeds. Yeah, they they do. Oh, yeah, okay. we we fed them pumpkins. I didn't know that that was uh, a worming thing, but there are some really good nutrients in in pumpkins. There's selenium in pumpkins, which is really essential for mm. uh, most animals. Huh. I wonder. I don't know I wonder, if it has anything to do with that, but I don't, I wonder, that's I interesting. It, I wonder if it'll work with the worms in the yanks. Yeah, so that's just something you should look into. Yeah, I'll just yeah I'm buy actually. More we're gonna we're gonna grow a bunch of pumpkins this year because my dad loves making um, or roasting mm. the seeds, and then we're gonna use the rest for for feed. So I'll yeah, I'll try to feed some to the yaks because it was mostly gonna go to the pigs. But um, yeah, that's cool. That's interesting. Thanks for uh, mentioning that. that. I don't know if it'll work with yaks, but I hope it does because <laughs> that would be yeah. a whole lot easier than buying medication for them, I'm sure. Because there was like all yes. kinds of medication for that. And I was like, ah. and it, it was really expensive. Mm-hmm. And I was like, yeah, I'll go home and see if there's something like some sort of like home remedy. And everything was like even even legit like doctor sites were like, no, don't spend your money on that. Just pumpkin. Just give them canned pumpkin. They'll be good to go. Like, really? Like, yeah. Hmm. And I guess pumpkin seeds do the same for humans. So, like, my mom was really okay. big every Halloween when we got pumpkins to, like, make pumpkin seeds and, like, eat eat these, eat them, which was – she didn't have to force us too hard. Pumpkin seeds are amazing. Anybody oh, yeah. who speaks ill about pumpkin seeds. Uh, uh, oh, get yeah. out. Yeah, get out. Whee! <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So. yeah, so that's interesting. But, yeah, so we solved that issue, and, and um, I had pigs breeding way too often. I don't, I don't know if I talked about that, but um, – these I have I got a cross mix. I got pot belly, Vietnamese pot belly crosses into my uh, American guinea hog herd, and those pot bellies they mature very quickly. You know they were mature at like four months, and they were they were out in the field fucking um, just left and right. So now I, I I just got rid of a bunch of those pigs, and now their babies have been born this last week or two. So hmm. I have twenty piglets to replace all of them. But I would say that since this summer is coming um those solutions or those issues are are pretty much solved so i'd say that things are going smooth like for the last month um has has been pretty good that's good yeah and uh, you got meat for sale if people mm-hmm. are in the oregon area they can go pick up meat that's right if you are in oregon look up hazelton farms hazeltonfarm.com or farms.com either one and uh you can find my contact info. I'll be at the Corvallis Farmers Market on Saturdays from, I guess, this Saturday until September. Um, and you can get some yak and some pork there. Nice. So um, your old show used to be about philosophy. Maybe mm-hmm. we should talk about that. <laughs> Since you haven't been talking about it too much on your – no, that's not true. You've been talking a little bit about stoicism. But they're only in like what twelve to fifteen minute increments, um, right? Yeah. So you've been on this because when you first came on the podcast, you were, were no. I think you actually were just transitioning out of being a nihilist, weren't you? Probably. Or were you a nihilist? I don't remember. I I honestly don't remember. I was a nihilist. I, yeah. Right. Yeah. I think we were a nihilist during the same time. We overlapped there, mm-hmm. um, at least periodically. Did I turn you on to to nihilism when Ooh. we? Um, when we did the show, you you we did a show together on anarcho yactualism. It's like episode sixteen, I think. I don't think we got into ethics at all. But um, we didn't talk about stoicism, but we talked about nihilism. Yeah, nihilism was kind of intriguing me before. I, I remember when when you just got on the Freedom Fiends, and I was talking to Michael. This is before I was even on, and we were talking about nihilism and stuff because because of you, like you you be, being on the podcast as a regular, and I was like, yeah, this is like. But um, I was like, yeah, I was already a nihilist at that point. And I think the reason why I got into nihilism is because there was kind of like a group on Facebook called the PG Nihilists. And um, because there was like this guy named PG or Pikachan or whatever his fake name was at the time. But we all called him PG. And he had like this weird brand of like nihilism that was really kind of out there. <laughs> it was like uh, like a, almost, it was almost like a straw man version of nihilism, but like serious. <laughs> and it was kind of intriguing to kind of take a look at that perspective and go, Oh, okay. What is nihilism actually about? And, uh, I know that ex omniverse was kind of dipping into it as well. And I got into that, but now I'm starting to see myself more as like a soft O objectivist or an, or a, an ethical egoist. I don't mm-hmm. know. I don't know about as far as ego, ego, egoist anarchism, I have some criticisms about that, but 
but as far as the ethics go, I'm pretty on board, which is all about like self-interest. You do what's in your best mm-hmm. self, your self-interest. You'll eventually have to help people along the way because it's not good in your own self-interest just to be doing things at the expense of others. You actually have to help people along the way. Uh, and when you do that, you're going to have the best outcome. And that's what's quote unquote moral, even though it's not really moral. Like there is no hard dogma on morality, you know. Which I think is a kind of interesting perspective, and that's what I've been taking. But you've been on the stoicism kick. I had never even heard of it, but I guess Bill Bupert's into it too, or something. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's give who us a primer, I got into I it from. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I would say first that I I hold that same belief on ethics, and this is where I kind of come from: is that um, I'm trying to do what's best for my life, right? And that is helping people. And that stoicism, I think, is a tool that has helped me live a better life um mostly because i think it's it's very in tune or i guess at the focus of it at least for me there's the ancient philosophy of stoicism can get very complicated but i try to focus on the ethics of stoicism and the focus on that really to me is to live in accordance with uh, what's going to happen Mm -hmm. don't try to fight things that are not in your control right they they say that um the, I think the main thing of Stoicism is live in accordance to nature, and what that means is, is fate. So live in accordance to fate. You know that's what's going to happen. So that's basically the idea. Of, if if that makes sense, yeah. Don't try to control things that you can't control. That makes a lot of sense. Um, and so you've been applying it to yourself, and is, it's not, is it? It's not an ethical thing, though, is it? Is it... Um, I mean, it's it depends on how you define ethics, right? A lot of people will say that it. Ethics is, um, you know, what's right and wrong. You know, what's more, we're talking about morality. And to me, you know, what morality is, is it, as a consequentialist, um, it's the consequences, <gasps> right? You're a consequentialist. Oh, you're oh a my goodness. You're not a real libertarian, et cetera. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I liked what you said in that last episode with uh, MK. It's been around for a while. This isn't a new thing. Yeah, <laughs> this um, is not new. I don't know why everybody's all of a sudden surprised. I was like, bring out the right. por- pitch, uh, p- pitchforks and torches already. You guys are late. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, like, what I, I don't remember what I was going for, actually. I don't remember what I was saying. Um, Ethics. Ethics. Okay, Stoicism. yeah. Ethics is typically about what's right and wrong, right? But to me... Um, what's right and wrong is what's going to bring the best possible outcome Mm -hmm. right and um that's what i'm going for what is the best possible outcome and that's you know that's very hard to define i won't get into it but to me um i've found that stoicism has been very helpful in trying to um i guess i don't want to say mitigate adversity but um dealing with with hard shit i guess with things that you don't like and and things that you know are going to happen um maybe you regret but kind of dealing with struggle i think that stoicism has been very powerful because there's there's a few practices that i try to use um the first one i talk about is negative visualization so i'm trying to instead of going the route well let's just assume it's going to be positive how only positive vibes (laughs) You know, that's I hate those not, people so much. Uh, it's ridiculous. <laughs> um, it's I don't know. It's you can live that way. And, and for the short time, I think that when you're, you know, going up to a situation, maybe, you're like, oh, it's only going to be positive. We're only going to think that way. Whatever's going to happen is going to be all right. Um, that's great until what happens isn't right. Because mm-hmm. what you think doesn't, you know, dictate what's going to happen next. Right. You, you don't control that. So the stoic instead would would think well what's the worst thing that could possibly happen you know if i'm going to talk to jim today what's the worst thing that's going to probably i you know i can't think that was a bad example but <laughs> there's a lot of the, like for example tell me a joke how do you make a hot dog stand take away its chair <sighs> that was the worst one yet that was the worst thing that could possibly happen. But I think we just proved, we just demonstrated the philosophical concept. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> What's the worst thing that can happen? Yeah, that. Yeah. Uh-huh. It can be bad. So, QED. <laughs> <laughs> so the idea would be to think about what's the worst thing that could possibly happen and then prepare for it. So 
I guess a, a better example of negative visualization would be um, thinking about if you might lose your job and what would you do if that happened? What would be the worst possible scenario so that you could prepare for it either mentally or you know financially or whatever it happens to be? Um, this just kind of fits in line with the survivalist prepping kind of world, I guess. Yeah. Um, Creating an FU fund. That's a big one. Yeah. yeah. So you could do... Um, that's the w one way I would use negative visualization. Um, and that's a practice of stoicism. Okay. I think, yeah. And then there are, there are many others. I'm kind of forgetting them as I, there's like three things I like to talk about, but the, I think the other one is, is focusing on your sphere of control. Um, understanding what's in your influences, what's under your control and what's outside of those. Like I can influence you, Jim, by talking to you, mm -hmm. but you're not under kind of my control. Right. So the idea would be to the stoics is, since you can't control it, there's no assurance that things are going to go the, the right way. You know, there's, there's no assurance that Jim's going to be nice to me or, or be my friend because um, he controls himself, right? I don't. I have no part in that. Right. Um, you can influence that that decision, though. Sure. Like, you can make fun right. of me and insult me, and I'll, I can just be like, well, screw this guy. <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> but, if, you know, if, if, you're all, if you're all, you know, bringing me cake and honey, I'm going to be like, oh, cool. I like this guy. <laughs> Sure. Or, I, or I could be like, all right, this guy is trying to sweeten me up. I, I, something's wrong. <laughs> Red flag, but yeah. Yeah. So what the Stoic would do is to try to not be affected by you, right? They're, the idea would be to make sure that your happiness and your livelihood doesn't rely on things that are out of your control. So I'm not going to be upset when I get fired. Because, and I mean, obviously, if you're getting fired, there may be something that you did wrong. But if there isn't, right, you can't control it. You're going to do as best as you can to keep your job. But in the end, it's not your decision to keep your job. So you're not going to let yourself be affected by that. That's a very hard thing to do. I think that that's um, it possibly could be unrealistic <laughs> to be the perfect stoic in that regard. I think that I'm going to be upset if I lose my job. I don't have one, but you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Um these are things that are definitely going to affect us. But the idea of this of stoicism is to try not to be affected by them. And I've found a lot of success in, in really slowly expanding, um, I guess, my resiliency to uh, struggles and adversity like that. Okay. And I know that you had a talk with Brian Sovereign because Brian Sovereign was critical of stoicism. And he's more of the egoist but he's also a hedonist too i i I've, I've come in contact with like hedonism and not the straw man version of it and it's, it's sort of persuasive i see where it's coming from but no nah, i'll pass um but like he has some criticisms of it and, and i don't know if you were like influenced by those at all were you like what were um, what they? do you mean was was uh, he, when he brought them to me mm -hmm. influenced by what he had to say i yeah i definitely was i think that you know i'm i try to be very careful with you know what how i adopt new ideas and and how i look at old ideas i'm all in favor of of smashing you know my own idols so I, what he had to say i had already kind of come to the agreement with you know he's there's there's a very big theme of uh, virtue and duty in stoicism where you know all pretty much all the examples of um of the great stoics are people who were either in charge or at the very low rung, right? These are people who have a benefit. Um, so you're you're to keeping a people. That's what it is. <laughs> Get off my show. You don't agree to nap anyway. Go ahead. <laughs> so, but but so these people. Have, um, I don't remember what I was saying, but okay, the the virtue and duty. You're saying thing. how you're so gonna they... get off my show now. <laughs> <laughs> But these people had a, a kind of a vested interest in trying to keep the the status quo, trying to keep people in line with their duty, right? Mm -hmm. To serve the state or to serve the common good has been a big theme in in the Stoic history. And that's something that I take issue with because I don't like the idea of obligations, um, the inherent obligations saying you have to do this based on you live in this world. So you have to follow this moral code and do these things. And that's what a lot of what I thought Brian was was bringing up to me um, as as criticisms, and uh, I thought those were pretty valid, honestly. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, those are yeah, those are those are good criticisms. But I think that stoicism as a tool to overcome adversity is is more of where my focus is. 
because th there are some wacky things in stoicism it's an ancient philosophy so they they had a whole explanation of how the cosmos worked and how you know everything you know they they had a metaphysical and epistemological philosophy too but i mean none of that makes sense um as i think that most of the uh, metaphysical and epistemological great work has been done recently and the stoics definitely were behind um that and yeah they didn't they didn't have the level of scientific instruments and technology that we have today uh, so a lot of it is um wacky but the ethics I think, yeah there's a lot of sense. wacky shit with objectivism but that's why i'm a small mm -hmm. o you know especially with the whole stuff of you know he can't be an anarchist you know and can't be an anarchist and an objectivist but read my book where we talk about these people who start their own you know anarchist society what what right yeah uh, okay um and then like she would also talk about how like she wouldn't or what was it I heard on Michael Malice. I don't know if it's true, but it sounds it sounds like it, if, if he's saying it about objectivism and he's he's still an objectivist, small o, uh, not completely, I guess, because he's an anarchist, too. But he was saying that, like, he wouldn't she wouldn't neuter her cats because she wanted her cats to have that pleasure. <laughs> okay. And the whole thing about, like, smoking is 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 a rational act because, you know, it, it symbolizes the fire of the mind and. There's all kinds of weird, crazy shit in objectivism, but it's like, okay, but I'm still going to take the, the ethical the thing from it. I'm going to leave the, the word selfishness behind because uh, I don't think that's the right word she's using and then bring all that stuff over. But I, I do like – I think, I think um, <clears throat> egoism is a little bit better explained. And there's also things about egoism where I'm just like, okay, that's a little, that's a little weird. Like the whole like you know my property. And the, yeah. Like you're my property. Sure. Yeah. So I mean, yeah, yeah, there's there's some interesting things, but yeah, every philosophy kind of has that, right? Nothing's perfect. Yeah, I think it's the best thing to do is take the pieces that make sense and and you know slap your own, together your own little philosophy. Right? Yeah, it can't all be UPV, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh wait, <laughs> never mind. A bad example. <laughs> but, yeah. So, I mean, like, how have you been? At least, as, as in terms of your farm, how's how's that how's that been working out? I mean, you you you're, you're, you actually did die of worms, so there's that. <laughs> <laughs> sure. So I think that it's been it's been very useful um, for me in that regard, um, being able to understand. You know what I I, although it I, you know. I'll, I think I deserve to take blame. These animals are under my control right. or not. I shouldn't say control in the philosophical sense, but you know, in the, like the legal sense, I guess, is that, is that make sense of a distinction? Like I'm responsible for them. Right. Right. Um, I can't control them, which is kind of anti-stoic to, I guess, to take responsibility, but I, I have to. Um, so it's, it's helped me be able to understand, well, I'm, I can't really control these animals. If they get out, you know, it's going to happen. So I'm not going to be upset by it. You know, it sucks. The animals die and it sucks that it's my fault. But, you know, what can I do about it now? Um, that's kind of trying to focus on that. W what can you do now? Mm -hmm. You made some mistakes. Okay. Um, yeah, it sucks. And let's learn from them. You know, that's that's really all you can take. And so it, I think that a lot of people get caught up in... Um, the kind of woe is me and you know all the emotions kind of attached to a lot of struggles and i i don't know I, I think there are plenty of people who do a fine job with dealing with it but i think on average most people uh, had definitely have an issue with reacting in that way and and there's a reason why we react with emotions i think but um and I don't want to say just shut them off, right? I think it's very valuable to recognize them. But at the same time, if they're hindering you, you know, that's that's a problem, right? So yeah. let's try to find a way to not let negative emotions like sadness or fear or guilt get in your way as long as you're right. I, I think that, that – does that make sense? I yeah, guess? that makes sense. Yeah, but I, and, yeah, I was listening to kind of Brian's critique of it, and it seems like he he was okay with the tools, and that, that was kind of good. Mm -hmm. And the whole aspect of, you know, let's just preserve these previous power structures but using this philosophy. I get that. And how it's, like, really popular with, like, with people in the armed services. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that was a big thing that he brought up. I thought it was interesting. And it's the same thing that Bill Bupert says is, you know, he, he 
I don't remember what Bill used to do, but um, he was really big into stoicism because I think he was introduced to it th through his service in the military. Okay. And uh, I think that's the same thing with Brian. Um, and it's a big thing because, you know, soldiers have to face a, a great deal of adversity. You know, you're going through boot camp and training. That's hard shit. <laughs> I don't, or, I've never done it. I don't plan on doing it, but I know people who have done it. And yeah. it's, it's a hard thing to do. And then dealing with the stresses of, of combat. Um, I mean, that's a serious thing, right? Yeah. So having some sort of tool to help you out, uh, is, it's probably necessary. So it makes sense that people, uh, under extreme stress, like those in the military, it would turn to that. Yeah. I don't know. I, I really, I think now that I'm really thinking about it, I think the tools could be effective, but yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't go as far as to call myself a stoic. I wouldn't call myself an egoist either. Maybe an ethical <laughs> egoist or a small objectivist somewhere in there. But yeah, like some of the crazy stuff that's in there is just like, yeah, I'll just dig what I want from this stuff and move along. <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think that, yeah, I think that's exactly what people should do with, with everything. Um, I think that's what makes the most sense because you can't, I mean, obviously every, not everybody's going to get it exactly right. There's so many ideas out there and it doesn't really make sense that one person just came up with all of the exact right ones. You know, object, objectivism got it all right because, you know, we're all trying to focus on different areas and we're only looking at things through certain lenses, right? It's, I think it's pretty wise and, and pretty reasonable to say that um, you shouldn't just be following one person's ideas. Yeah. Yeah, that makes a whole, because, you know, the, one of the things that always bother me about libertarians is that they'll just, they'll, they'll take whatever prevailing f school of thought that's in libertarianism, which is usually anarcho-capitalist uh, Austrian school, and then, like, they're basically on board with everything, and they don't really... I'm sure they give it a lot of thought, but I don't think they give it a lot of critical thought. They don't really think like, okay, let's try to debunk this cause thing. Because that's what I usually do when anytime I'm confronted with any kind of new idea is to go, okay, well, what's wrong with it? Because if you don't examine it through like, okay, what's wrong with this? What could be some problems with this? What could be some negative outcomes because of this? If you're not thinking in terms of that, then you're not really critically thinking. You're just kind of like, if you just using the kind of the kind of cards that they kind of help you understand the philosophy because in every philosophy they'll say like you know like you may think this but here's you know here's here's why that would be wrong if you did think this and as long as you're thinking in those terms and you're like okay that makes sense you and then you actually hear some outside criticism you're going to automatically think that oh they're talking about these things that's where they're wrong and there's a lot of things that that I just kind of bought hook, line, and sinker when it came to libertarianism, that once I started actually thinking about it, I was like, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense, right? Um, so, I mean, like, like argumentation ethics, I, I just thought that was a given. And then I really sat mm -hmm. down and thought about it, and I was like, this is a really bad line of reasoning. And I've listened to Kinsella's defense of it, and I'm not, I'm not persuaded by it at all. It's... The argument that, you know, like just by just just the fact that we're having a discussion, whether or not the NAP is valid, proves it because you're acting in accordance with the NAP. But that only applies for this particular time in this particular circumstances with the people that are involved in that debate. You could say like, oh, I think when it comes to debating the NAP, you should vo you should follow the vo uh, NAP. But anytime anyone disagrees with anything else, you should beat the shit out of them until they agree. Like you can still have that that op op opinion. It would be consistent. You know, it's it. You're only talking about that particular thing. And I'm not. I don't. I think the worst line of reasoning when it comes to proof is, um, uh, 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 shit. I can't. Performative contradictions. I think is a horrible line of reasoning. Because you can live in a determinist universe and try to convince someone that determinism is real, right? <laughs> or that. Mm -hmm. So I mean, it, it, yeah, it's performative contradictions are kind of a weird thing. But once you start like explaining it to people, some people will just freak out. What? But that's another thing. And it's it's always been kind of good to kind of like, well, what's wrong with my theories? And try to like just sit down one day and go, well, what is wrong with the NAP? What is wrong? What would be some real problems with with that? And try to work it out logically and try to find holes in something. And that's how you make yourself a little bit uh, a little bit stronger in your your convictions, I guess. All right. Yeah, I, okay. I think so exactly. And I think that I've seen a, a lot of people in the libertarian movement do that, especially recently. It seems I, maybe I don't know enough 
newly minted libertarians and you know when i be when i was uh, introduced to all the newly minted libertarians i was one too and now we've all progressed i don't know what the deal is but i don't see a whole lot of um uh i don't i guess talk about the non-aggression principle i think it's definitely still there i still see it but there's definitely a lot of more people who have come more towards um the egoist and um i guess just being skeptical yeah. right i was i've been quite surprised like um like when Jeremy was on last time, he was talking about how he's kind of moved towards that too. Yeah. And I was like, well, damn, I feel like I had <laughs> arguments with him about how the nap was. Um, I don't know if we have argued, I don't know, but it just seemed like I, for some reason I thought, well, that surely he's, he's not, he hasn't jumped over this way. Nobody's been doing that. Mm -hmm. um, but a lot of people have. Yeah. Um, I think that's because people in the libertarian movement kind of, you know, there's an already an anti-authoritarian spirit right yeah and don't it's, tell it's me what to do easy don't tell me yeah. Napper. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah and i think it's pretty easy to translate that into well if you don't trust them uh for these reasons why don't we try and see what like, well, what if we're doing these things too in our yeah. own philosophy and um it's pretty easy to for people who are very aware of criticism of other ideas to to then take those um criticisms and turn them around right yeah. because people are looking for consistency and it seems in this philosophical movement um, but i think that's a that's a pretty cool thing that has been going on yeah not that it has to be completely consistent I, I, I reject kind of universality because there, there's conditions where mm -hmm. you can where doing one thing would be right and then doing that same exact thing in another circumstance would be absolutely horrible <laughs> you know yeah yeah it really I think depends that on the conditions yeah, I think that most people don't recognize a lot of nuances. Um, it's, it's it's so attractive to try to explain the world in a black and white way, mm -hmm. whether it's ethics or science, whatever you want it to be. Uh, but the fact is, is you know, we're human beings. We don't really know everything about um, our reality. There are a lot of factors that are going on, and it's at least for our minds, it's very hard to input all of those, right? And trying to to make sense of everything going on. Right, because we can come up with the non-aggression principle and say, you know, aggression is bad in in every sense of the word, but you know, how do we def define um, bad? And then it, it gets pretty complicated pretty quick, right? And it's so it's pretty hard to to try to make it very consistent. And yeah, I'm I'm with you. I've kind of given up on it. Um, just I just want things to make sense, right? That I want them to be uh, practical and accurate. That's kind of what I'm going for. When I'm looking at philosophy, not consistency. Yeah, you should be consistent in your own philosophy, though. That that's yeah, but <laughs> consistency. Right, in philosophy you shouldn't be hypocritical. A... Like say that aggression is bad, and then say aggression is good. Right, or, you should say that aggression is bad. And nuanced. Then file the MCAs against people who disagree with you. Right. Yeah. Yes. That sort of thing. Yeah, I get it. Yeah. I mean, you should do that. Um, you should look for like some consistency in stuff. I mean, if if things are just completely inconsistent and just off the wall, yeah, then it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Yeah, but just because like you can find one little glaring problem with it, well, it's like okay. But overall, is it correct? It could be. There's lots of things that are like very logically consistent, but don't translate into the real world. I think. I don't. I'm not. I, maybe I should probably start reading Marx again and, and get back into that. Not <laughs> not to be a communist, but just to know it from a from a critical analysis. But uh, from what I understand, like communism is pretty like the the philosophy itself is you know is is pretty like consistent and but it it doesn't work out in reality. Like we we can see that it doesn't work out in reality. You can't expect a state to wither away. It's just going to get bigger and bigger and bigger and then you know collapse and everybody's going to be harmed and they're just going to institute some sort of quote unquote liberal regime to you know pick up the pieces that's how we yeah you know, that's that's kind of the part of the chorus for communism but it's you know it's logically consistent <laughs> you know like so yeah I'm, it, just because it's consistent doesn't mean it's correct right yeah, yeah. and yeah logical consistency doesn't really determine truth right because we can we can set up a parameters and or you know a system of logic like you know communism does right they start up with a some basic um assumptions and then they build off of it right but are those basic assumptions true yep and that's the problem yeah yep so anything else on stoicism that i should know since or at least get me 
is there is there like some sort of like because I'm not big in, into like I don't know for some reason reading has just been like an issue with me like audiobooks and podcasts have been a little bit better for me like I, I, it's not that I can't read it's just I'm like one of those people like I, I I've kind of overcome my mild dyslexia a little bit but my problem now is my mind kind of like figured out a way to work around that by like anytime I start reading I'll start thinking about like. Yeah, work yesterday was really weird. Why were they acting like that? While I'm actually reading the text, <laughs> my brain will just like yeah. diverge from what I'm reading and have to go. Ah, all right. Start Damn, from the, start the chapter. The yeah, go back to the chapter again and read. It. Yeah, so I have problems with that. Um, you know, it's just ADD for you. Um, I yeah. I have that same issue. So I only listen to I, I pretty much only listen to audiobooks. Yeah. Um, but if you're asking for resources that people could go to, right, um, right, right. That's what I'm currently listening to a book that was recommended by Scott Hebert, um, who runs the Stoic Metal podcast. This is the only po uh, podcast on Stoicism, um, at least that's focused on it that I can find. Stoic Metal is Stoic, S T O I C. Um, what is it called again? And, and, Stoic metal, but it's M E T T L E metal. And Scott Hebert, you spelled right, but you missed an E there in the notes. But yeah, Scott Hebert. Don't tell me what um, to do. <laughs> he does a great show, and he does he does very simple uh, presentations of it. It's like a seven minute presentation. The last one was on negative visualization, um, and I think he does a really good job at explaining it. So I would say that he's kind of my um, he's the kind of the guy that I go to. Bill Pubert has some presentations with uh, Brett Vinod of the School uh, Sucks podcast. It's like a okay. long time ago he did those. But I would say that those are pretty um, pretty complicated. And I would say that like my presentations um, from Yakin with Nick and anarcho Yakitalism are much easier to understand. It's a stoic metal podcast. Well, yeah, you're you're a little biased on that one, aren't you? I would say <laughs> <Okay>. probably, <laughs> um, but I would say, yeah, Scott does a better job than I do. And I do a better job than Bill because Bill is just so, um, he's fun to listen to and don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to diss Bill, but he's just goes on these tangents and it's a very, it's a very complicated conversation if you're trying to just get the ideas. Um, so I would suggest those I'm reading a book called Ryan or shit. What's it called? The obstacle is the way by Ryan holiday. Um, okay. And I've heard that book recommended by many people. So those you can type that in the notes since you're like spell checking my notes. <laughs> yeah, you misspelled like everything there. Right, but, but every single thing. But I, I, right, I'm, but I'm because I'm typing with one hand and I'm reaching over my recorder and like way reaching. And I'm just like, all right, what's the way I can type this without the least amount of things that I can still read later? That's why I'm typing it. So, yeah. Because oh, okay. the way I had the setup, because <laughs> I had to like redo my setup for the show so many times. That's why you see like a lot of episodes. They'll be like really quiet, then really loud, and then really quiet, really loud again. But we just kind of we've kind of reached normalcy, I guess, recently because I like this setup and I'm familiar with it now. Uh, I'm getting a little bit more comfortable with getting the levels right. I mean, there's a couple episodes where I had like the one I did with um, Ben Stone, like I was really quiet. Uh, but that's fine because I I wanted him to talk anyway. <laughs> that's what I really yeah, wanted. Yeah. I just wanted him to to really get out all of his thoughts. So, any hoodle, um, I'm trying I'm trying to get Jeremy to wrap this thing up so he can come and talk about his uh, his, uh, his 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 Jedi battle with the news camera. Lady. <laughs> Jedi. Yeah, I'm excited to to hear back from him. And yeah, I've missed Jeremy. He's got. Um... Well, he's still doing know, his he podcast, so but he's right? yeah, but he's you oh, know, is he? he? Yeah, but it's it's like Shoot. there's a giant elephant in the room on every show. At least they acknowledged it last <laughs> time. They were like, "All right, yeah, there's there's an elephant in the room." <laughs> like I can't talk about it yet, but we will. We'll get to it when I can legally. Um, so yeah, yeah. Um, so those are the resources. Those are good. All right, I'll put those. I'll put those in the show notes if I can remember. We'll see about that. Um. You got anything to say about this? Tell me a joke. A man walks into a bar with a slab of asphalt under his arm and says, a beer, please, and one for the road. So, so dumb. Oh, uh, I was I was at least hoping for, like, the, the ouch joke. Guy walks into a bar, ouch. Uh, yeah. 
that, that was that would have worse. That would have been better. I would have probably laughed at that one because I wouldn't have seen that one coming. Even though I've heard that before, I wouldn't have heard that coming. But that was just <sighs> that oh, wow. killed me inside. Like, he, like <laughs> it's just... I should follow stoicism. That way, I would know that every time I did that, I'd be like hurt emotionally by by asking that question. But... Mm -hmm. Then you could look at your sphere of control, Jim, and you could realize, well, I don't, I control me and and pressing that button. So I'm not going to press that button and yeah. ask, tell a joke. Unless yeah. I really want to hear a bad joke. Tell me a sure. bad joke. What do you get if you cross an elephant with a kangaroo? Big holes all over Australia. <laughs> Why you do that? Why did I do that to myself? I don't know. I guess I'm a masochist. So you want to plug your website before we go? <laughs> Yes, I I no longer do the anarcho yakitalism podcast, but oh, I have wow. a new one, Yakin with Nick. If you go to Just Yakin, that's Y A K K I N Y A two Ks I N. You missed a G. Just, there's no G. I I know, but you 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 missed. Oh, the G. but I missed it. Yes, well, I, yes, I, I, I did. figure you're you're correcting my notes. I might as well correct your title, <laughs> jerk. <laughs> yeah, no, it's just yakin dot libsyn dot com. That's L. I B S Y N. I always want to say Swy N. I don't know what the fuck is wrong with my mouth but want to do that. But Libsyn, that's Liberated Syndication. Lib libertarian Syndicalism? Is this yeah. I knew it. <laughs> I knew it, Infiltrator. Yeah, I'm on iTunes, Google Play, tune in, pretty much all podcatchers, Stitcher, find them. Uh, if you look up Nick Hazleton and Yaks, you might find anarcho yakitalism first, but if you go to, um, I think the latest episodes from anarcho yakitalism point to um, yakin with Nick, so you can find me there. Okay, sounds good. Good talking yeah. with you. Absolutely, um, Jim. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, worms. Worms. Tired of dealing with governments? Wish there was a better way of not getting busted committing victimless crimes? Tired of having to listen to your parole officer? Never again with the Bipcot NoGov Human License Wristband. This wristband has a NoGov patented NoGov hologram technologies that work on your aura chakras to fungus shui vibrational energy something something to woo state agents off of your trail. It's like they can't even see you. The best part is it actually works. It doesn't actually work. It's so easy to use. Just put it on your wrist or within three inches of your quantum sacred geometry spirit energy and commit all of the victimless crimes you want and totally get away with all of them. Them. And by all, we mean none. And with the fancy Lowbirds podcast logo on the side, you'll be the life of Porkfest. And all of this could be yours for $4.99 plus $2 shipping and handling. These statements have not been evaluated by the FDA, FTC, or any other three letters. This product is not intended to prevent, defend, or protect you from any legal actions from the state. This product contains chemicals known in the state of California to cause cancer and birth defects or other reproductive harm. Move to New Hampshire, Nevada, or anywhere else that isn't a shithole and you'll probably be fine. These bands are total bullshit. They don't actually work. If this needs to be said to you, you should probably drink bleach. This is just neat looking merchandise that can start an interesting conversation with yet to be libertarians. Order today at lulberts.com.